Buying a home can feel like navigating uncharted waters. Redfin agents can help. They'll answer your questions with honest advice so you know exactly what you're getting into. They'll also help you tour as many homes as you want and show you what it takes to make a winning offer. With a Redfin agent on your side, you can sail straight to your dream home. Local expertise from Redfin. That's real estate done right. Tour subject to property and agent availability. Virginia Office Falls Church, VA. 844-759-7732. Kind of baseline, and, and the song just kind of dictated that to me. But Hold on a second. I was just going to ask you something, and then I got so excited that we knew the same band. Welcome to WNC Original Music, episode 114, the Ama Piano episode. Joining the podcast this week is Matt Walsh. Matt Walsh is a very successful singer-songwriter from High Point, North Carolina. He joined us to talk about his most recent album, Burnout Soul, also uh, just his musical journey, his filmmaking, and his very special project called The Friday Night Gamble, which you, if you haven't heard of it already, is uh, his streaming variety show that he does uh, from his home it's really cool you should check it out he's got a lot of musicians from all over the place uh, mostly from you know the area western north carolina central north carolina but really from all over the country and and the world you can find matt's new album burnt out soul at all the streaming and download sites and you can also find all of his music at mattwalshmusic.net look for matt walsh music on facebook and youtube to see the friday night gamble Uh, You can also see old episodes up there. I think he has all the episodes um, cataloged up there. Again, that's Friday Night Gamble, Matt Walsh, Burnout Soul. Here's Matt Walsh.
Can't you hear the wind? Huh? I'm here no more. Um, that's uh, the first track on the new album, and um, it's it's a real rocker, I guess. Um, it's funny. <clears throat> a lot of the inspiration for that was um, kind of like um, Jimmy Rogers um, from Muddy Waters' first band um, with uh, Willie Dixon, Lil Walter, Otis Spann, and that kind of um those kind of guitar lines um that you hear in the song um for musicians especially on the one um they were kind of uh taken from listening to those old songs and just reimagined in another context and around that time i you know i'm i'm always revisiting um blues music because it was kind of the thing that, that started me in the first place to pick up guitar but um <clears throat> especially hubert Sumlin and howlin wolf i love that stuff and especially hubert um that that guitar plan had a huge influence on me um as far as tone and 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 a lot of what i do today it may not sound like that kind of stuff but it's very informed by it and so it just so happened that that during the the solo the guitar solo of the song i just really kind of went to this kind of hubert Sumlin mode not not really trying to recycle licks or anything like that but just i think it just somehow crept into me and i I just started getting the vibe and uh so it's really funny because a, a, a more than a few people have told me since they heard that song this like you know heard the album that the the guitar part reminds them of hubert Sumlin, which is kind of kind of wild considering that's kind of where i felt it was coming from too but um you know those those the old blues music and stuff like that the old chicago blues early electric blues in memphis and and uh, mississippi and all those places alabama all that stuff you know that made it down to you know say bill street in the 50s all that stuff really had has always had a huge impact on me and and i was really um, fortunate enough early in my career when i put my first album out hard luck back in 2007 um around that time i had also uh, befriended Bob Margolin, who was uh, was Muddy Waters' guitar player for, oh, I think eight or nine years. <clears throat> I think from like 1974 to 81, something like that. So um, th- through that friendship, when my first album came out, um, Bob was trying to help it get off the ground a little bit. He, he played on a couple songs on it and helped me produce it to a degree. Um, but anyway... Uh, he would he kind of came up with this good idea to, to get me out there and stuff um and, and kind of get my name around the country would be that he was like hey you know <clears throat> if you want to come play bass with me on the bandstand you know uh, on these gigs i promise you that every set i'll let you sing two songs and play guitar oh, yeah. and, and kind of have your moment to shine and he was he was a real gracious really gracious about it too and and allowed me to sell my music from the bandstand and everything just like he did but through those <clears throat> those um shows i had the opportunity to play with guys like i, I got to play with you someone mm-hmm. a handful of times and uh what a treat that was because i mean i had i'd been listening to hubert since i got my first howlin wolf record i think from the public library of all places when yeah. i was like 12 years old you could go <laughs> Yeah. I found out you could actually go up to the public library in Statesville, North Carolina, <laughs> and they had this uh, 
just, I don't even know how I found it just on a whim, but they had just a huge collection of old records, you know, I mean, anything from chess to meteor to all these old cool labels. And you could, I could, I could go up there and check out like a Robert Nighthawk record or, you know, a book of white record, sun house, all these guys. And I mean, this is, this is back in like, you know, 1988, 89. And, and you, you couldn't, find see you know you couldn't just that stuff just wasn't accessible i mean right. we could go to the record bar and about in in the mall and like the the best you could hope to to find would be maybe like a bb king record right right yeah <laughs> you know? so it was a real gold mine and and i remember the first helen wolf record i ever got i almost got hit walking across the street back home i, I was walking back home almost got hit crossing the street because i was looking at the back of this record and and the thing the first thing i saw on the back was it's a it's a classic photo of wolf and he's kind of making this wild expression he's playing a white stratocaster and he's kind of playing it sideways but you see hubert back there and he's playing this really cool um italian guitar i can't remember what it was called but he, he told me he got it it was stolen from him mm -hmm. uh, over over in germany or somewhere but anyway, just to, to get to play with those, with him and, and a couple others, Pine Top Perkins, Willie Big Eyes Smith, um, it just, you know, that music always has, has, has made a huge impact on me as far as, like I said, my guitar tone and playing and uh, to a degree. Uh, and and so it's, it's always kind of deep down, you know, I, what I do isn't blues music. You know, mm -hmm. some people say I, what I do is rock and roll. Some people say it's blues to me. It's not, I think it's, it's not really, um, being truthful to say it's blues music, but it's definitely informed everything I do somehow has a right. little bit of that sprinkle in it, you know? Yeah. And so come here no more was a song that really drew heavily. I think from, from those kinds of things like uh, Howlin' Wolf um, and, and Jimmy Rogers and, and Hubert Sumlin. Just, you know, if you go back and listen to those old 50s records, you'll, you'll hear what I'm getting at. That's interesting to hear. Um, you know, you talk about this not blues, this rock and roll, but it's influenced and formed by blues, which is the origin of rock and roll. Like most people who play rock and roll now, they're influenced by rock and roll. So it just becomes right. the, exactly. circular. But you're exactly. kind of influenced by blues and then country and then, you know, rhythm and that sort of thing. So it kind of has the original genesis of rock and roll uh, versus kind of being recycled. I agree with that. Right. Um, because, you know, that's kind of what I thought Come Here or No More was when it was finally done. I figured, well, it's just a blues song for um, 2020. You know, mm -hmm. not, not that, not, not, the, not the subject matter, but just, you know, if, if I, if I got to be called, if something's got to be called blues, let's, let's, let's lean it towards that, that I do, you yeah. know, because that, that definitely had the feel of all those guys in it. And even though you might not be able to do it, well, that don't, you know, somebody might put it on. So well, that sounds absolutely nothing like Howlin' Wolf <laughs> and, or Hubert song or whatever. It's not that I'm trying to sound like them. It's yeah. just that, you know, what I found about songwriting is this and it's an interesting thing you know they can tell you to go to all these you know which i think is absolute absolutely ridiculous and if you find if if you look at youtube i found last weekend bobby Whit whitlock a famous songwriter with Derek and the dominoes mm -hmm. and, and played on all things must pass with george harrison piano player you know he agreed with this too <laughs> and i always laughed at like the idea of going to um a songwriting seminar or learn how to write, learn how to write songs at a mm -hmm. seminar or something like that, because I really don't think you can learn to do, I think you can, you can hone that craft, but it's not something you just say, well, I'm going to be a songwriter and learn how to do that. You yeah. know, right. So the one thing I do find though, as a songwriter is all these things, um, you really, you, in my, in my case, what helps me the most is, 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 is the endless well of of music that I guess I've tapped into or listened to, and I'm not tooting my horn or anything like that. I'm just saying that it helps me in that I never get I've never experienced writer's block. I never have. Even with this album, I, I was forced to sit down and write songs in two weeks' time. Uh, I had to write you know an album's worth of material, which is not the way I operate. But like I said, I've I've never been dried up you know as far as writing them and i think a lot of that is is just because it's not because i'm lucky or anything like that it's just because 
I've, I've made it a point to have a wide music of wide range of knowledge of American music and not only American music, but other, other music, you know, mm. um, West African music, all kinds of music. But, um, the thing is, is that it goes back to what you're talking about. You know, you say, well, you got a, a wealthy knowledge of country, all these things. So, and so a lot of people play rock and roll where well, they don't go too far back except rock and roll. And I think to really understand American music, you, you really have to dig back. And I mean, sometimes that means going back to the 1920s mm -hmm. or, you know, and, and I guess what I'm getting at is through that, <clears throat> I've been able to have this wide knowledge and, and playing this kind of stuff. And, and, and you may not hear it, but I mean, I have songs that, um, derive like a chord structure from, or, or a pattern from, a song maybe from 1925 <laughs> you know, it doesn't sound like that mm -hmm. but if you have those building blocks and that knowledge of how songs work and chords work and then you, you take that all the way up into you know 1960 or yeah. how things work there you go up and well, well here we go in the 70s and here we go in the 1980s you know people slam 198 a lot of people slam 1980s music but you know, if you if your ears are open, I think you can you can hear something really grand in every era yeah. that we that we've been through. It's just a, it's just hanging on to those good pieces of it, and I think going back and being able to to go, well, I'm influenced by that, and I'd like to maybe mix it up with this. You know, it, it's interesting to me to do that to do things like take take some something I've heard from a 1920s recording and mix it with you know. A thought from 1980s yeah, yeah. <laughs> synthesizers. Yeah, right, you know? right. That's, as yeah. long as it comes out sincere and doesn't sound like crap, right, you know? right. You're not so. not forcing it. But yeah, I yeah. mean, back in 1920s, they were. It's good to go back to those times when they were figuring out. Switching to Geico is a good idea, especially when you consider everything. First off, Geico makes it easy to switch. They have licensed agents available 24-7 online or over the phone. But if it's so easy, you might start thinking everything is easy, even big wave surfing. And it's not. It's actually quite difficult. Well, if you switch to Geico, you could save hundreds on car insurance. And you could keep saving by bundling your motorcycle, boat, and RV, plus your home or renter's insurance. But saving money might lead you to make some questionable purchases, like a 20-foot feather boa. And do you know how hard it is to clean a 20-foot feather boa? Well, they do have an industry-leading mobile app you can use to pay your bill, file and manage a claim, or add a new driver. But when life gets a little easier, it makes you too confident. And you start calling everyone ace. And you're better than that. Well, GEICO has a 97% customer satisfaction rating and has been saving people money for 85 years. It's hard to beat that. But you're right. Switch to GEICO. It's obviously a good idea. Out things, you know, it was yeah. like music was more accessible to s certain people because, you know, maybe they were making $50 guitars for the first time or something like that. So people who never, who had the talent, but never had access, they didn't, couldn't afford a harpsichord or something like that. You know, they could get a banjo or a guitar out of the Sears catalog and, um, and then do and something. I think with that's that. why, I think that's why you get guys like, you know, <clears throat> these, these great masters, you know, Robert Johnson and all these guys. Mm -hmm. You know, all these guys had one thing in common. They couldn't afford a guitar, so they were playing, like, the house. Yeah. That's what I like to say sometimes. They were playing the house, and people go, well, what does that mean? Like, playing, is that like a card term? <laughs> it's <was laughs> like, no. Nah. They literally put up some a piece of a plank here and a piece of plank here and, and ran their, their mother's broom yeah, wire, yeah. you know, around it and, and put a Coke bottle in the middle for a bridge. And I tell you what, you play one of them damn things long enough. I bet <laughs> if somebody hands you a real guitar, right. you can go to town on it. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> Kick your feet up, stay here a while Pay no mind that the world's on fire We won't worry today We fade out, hope fades away The wind blows through a 
burnt out soul There's nowhere to go Your head's drowning in gold You're breaking all your home Feel like a waste of time Now you can't remember your lines Things look the same around here Even though I don't see too clear I'm glad I'm lost in this town Thoughts are heavy, but I'm never down When the wind blows through a burnout soul There's nowhere to go Yeah, it's drowning gold And you're breaking all you hold You feel like you wasted time Now you can't remember your lines Burnout Soul. Now, that's funny because, you know, um, that song wasn't written, um, you know, during the pandemic or uh, not even the pandemic, just uh, it wasn't even written during the, the you know, the last um, year or two. So, but I think that song in a way, I just, uh, I think a lot of it was just getting sick of, you know, just, I don't know, you know, just for a short, short, short way of saying it, just, you know, uh, turning on every day and seeing that the world was on fire, you know, or getting ready to feel like it was going to be like that. And, and I'm just, I'm not the type of person that subscribes to all that kind of stuff and politics and, you know, taking up for this guy or that guy. So, I mean, I'm just, I'm more the type to just revert into my own world of what I do. That's, Mm -hmm that's what I'm here to do. And that's, that's what I do. So, um, that song just kind of, um, 
you know, it's it's no big statement or anything, but it's it's definitely, I think, a, a sympathetic tune to anyone that just, you know, just wants to kind of just lay back and chill and, yeah. you know, just, just live their life and, and, and not have to deal with a bunch of strife, I guess, you know, I, hard to put a, hard to put a finger on the pulse of that one. Cause like I said, you know, I just, the words just kind of come out on that came out on that one. So, um, but it's definitely one of my favorite songs to play. Oh, yeah. It really is. It is. Um, um, the one thing about that song, I will say, um, as far as, as the musical structure of it, um, you know, I think in songs, there's certain instruments in, in some songs, there's certain instruments that can really make a song and, and really drive it. Or, or if you don't realize it, cause a lot of, I think music is just playing a, a, a trick on the ears. You can fool people. But I think a lot of that, what makes that song work to me is the bass line hmm. on it. Um, I kind of, I just kind of felt like it and in a way I kind of felt like that kind of, I don't know if you ever heard this and here, this goes back to being influenced by something. It doesn't necessarily mean that, um, it's going to come through in the recording or your song, but you remember that old song back in the eighties, it was like, uh, the future so bright. I got to wear shades. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Who was that? I can't remember who that was. Uh, uh I don't remember who they were, Tim but Buck I remember Tim Tim Buck Buck two. Yeah. they Tim played Buck with a boom box. It was a man and a woman. And yeah. when they, they, they got their start, like, uh, I think just busking on the street and they had Is a boom right? box that I think was the bass and guitar, a pre-recorded bass and guitar on cassette. And then they played, you know, guitar and harmonica or something like that and sang. Yeah. I did not know that. Oh yeah. But for some reason between that, I was in that band. That's the only reason I, I'm, yeah, I'm Tim Buck. Really? And, yeah. My wife's name is too. Well, for some <laughs> reason, uh, the, that song influenced Burnout salt to a degree, as crazy that. as that yeah. sounds. Yeah, uh, the, the, the bass line, and it, I think it's a kind of real 1980s kind of bass line, and, and the song just kind of dictated that to me. But, but um, yeah, that's that's a fun one. Hold on, say I was just going to ask you something, and then I got so excited that we knew the same band, Timbuktu. And it's uh, easy for everybody, I think, to feel like a burnout soul. Right, yeah. yeah, it definitely is. <laughs> Somebody else asked me, so why, so another, another interviewer said, so why'd you call it burnout soul? I said, well, it's kind of like, you know, kind of made sense. You yeah. Know? yeah. Have you have you had a chance to play any of these songs uh, in front of like a large crowd or have they all been recorded oddly, kind of post-pandemic? Uh, oddly, oddly enough, um, I had a album release party um, the weekend the album came out album came out on a Friday and I did the release party that Saturday and um, it wasn't even a planned thing. I, I actually, you know, I, you know, I had no intentions of doing a release party, but it just so happened a guy that owns a place in my hometown um, called red Buffalo called me up and uh, he was like, Hey man, you know, uh, have you thought about coming out and playing at all or doing any gigs? And I was like, you know, not really. And he said, well, I've got an available date and it just happened to be the day after the, the album was released. Hmm. And I was, I was really spooked about going out and, uh, you know, I just figured people wouldn't come out and if they did, you know, it was just, you know, it just wouldn't work out, but for better or for worse, you know, uh, I have no, no control over these things to a degree, <laughs> but, uh, but I was, I was stunned that, that the place really packed out oh, yeah. and, actually had a like really large crowd to yeah. play to for a CD release or album release party. Um, so it looked, that went really well and it was great because, um, the guy that plays drums on the album, Chuck Cotton is an old friend of mine from back in the, uh, Bob Margolin days. He, he was Bob's drummer for the old, better part of 20 years, 15 years. And, uh, just a, a really well seasoned drummer. I mean, Chuck's just a, a one of a kind, cat and it was really cool um that he played with me just uh, just by chance on this album uh that because he he's more used to playing you know cover music blues music so this really took him out of um his comfort zone in a comforting way i think because it allowed him to just express himself and be chuck whatever that is you know mm -hmm. he didn't have to have any requirement like oh i gotta play a shuffle this way because it's a jimmy reed type tune you know i gotta play this so really left a lot of that um you know would tell him what i was looking for but i just 
you know, left a lot of it up to him. Um, so I can't remember where I was going with this, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he was fantastic on the album and, um, Oh, I know where I was going, where I was going with this. So, um, me and Chuck don't really get a chance to play together too much, especially, you know, these days, but it was really sweet because, um, he was able to do the album release party oh, with cool. me. So we were able to play and and replicate everything pretty much like the album. I was really really stunned oh, how that's nice. yeah. well that went after him not doing the songs for you know it's been well almost over a year since he had right. you know right. done that <laughs> stuff. So but it was fantastic. More from Matt Walsh in just a few moments. Want to remind you to check out uh, mattwalshmusic.net. That's dot net. I just went back and made sure that I said .dot net uh, in the first part of the show when I said his website address, and I did. You'll be happy to hear. Also, don't forget to go and look for the Friday Night Gamble. That's on Matt's Facebook page and also his YouTube page. And I think if you just uh, type in Friday Night Gamble in Google, it's pretty much going to take you there. I don't think it's going to get mistaken for anything else. Matt's got a few projects coming up. He's already working on his next album. He's got a record label called Full Bloom Records, and he's considering putting more musicians on that. He's working on a full-length film about the life of Buddy Hardwood. And uh, if you just go to Matt's social media pages, that'll be all you need to know about Buddy Hardwood. And he is working on producing some music for some local musicians, including one very well-known North Carolina musician. And I can't tell you uh, that musician's name because uh, Matt did not tell me. So Matt's got a lot going on. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. WNC Original Music is on all the platforms, all the really cool ones and uh, the not so cool ones. Also, uh, you can tell your smart speaker to play podcasts, WNC Original or WNC Original Music, depending on your speaker. You can also find the podcast on Amazon.com and on Audible.com, the streaming book service. For people who like to listen to books and music podcasts. This is Kim Ware of The Good Graces, and you're listening to WNC Original Music. Do you have any um, musical impressions that you do? Yeah, I got one. All right. Um, Man, he'd probably kill me for it, too. I don't even know if I should do it. Okay. He he probably won't hear it, but one of my dearest friends in the world is Mookie Brill, and... uh, if anybody knows Mookie, he he's an Italian guy. He lived in he's he's from New York. He, he family I thinks from New York, but uh, he's just a fantastic stand up bass player. And he's probably never heard me do it, but yeah, I can do a fantastic Mookie Brill imitation. And then it just goes something like this, you know, it's like it's like, it's like riding down the van with uh, you know Willie <laughs> and uh, Pine Top. You know, we go to a casino. Oh, there you go. So. <laughs> Very good. I uh, assume. <laughs> I don't know. No, Mookie no I don't mean no harm by that Mookie. That's if you right. hear this, you're one of my can, favorite people in the world. Can we get? Um, can Can you get us a, a video of Mookie talking? <laughs> yeah, he's on the. He was on the. Uh, I think he was on the fourth episode of the Friday Night Game. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll, yeah, I'll uh, he did a, splice a clip. He in did. There. Yeah, he did some great country songs, man, and. Uh, did a couple blues numbers. He he. I mean, he knows more country songs than you can shake a stick I got at. It right it's crazy. here. Hold on a second. Let me see if I can find him talking. You know, it was a big deal in New York. They had a lot of listeners, and I used to listen to them. I don't, you know, I used to listen to other stuff too. But uh, you know, I would listen to I used that. To listen to other stuff too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, that was very good. All right. Switching to GEICO is a good idea, especially when you consider everything. First off, GEICO makes it easy to switch. They have licensed agents available 24-7 online or over the phone. But if it's so easy, you might start thinking everything is easy, even big wave surfing. And it's not. It's actually quite difficult. 
Well, if you switch to GEICO, you could save hundreds on car insurance. And you could keep saving by bundling your motorcycle, boat, and RV, plus your home or renter's insurance. But saving money might lead you to make some questionable purchases, like a 20-foot feather boa. And do you know how hard it is to clean a 20-foot feather boa? Well, they do have an industry-leading mobile app you can use to pay your bill, file and manage a claim, or add a new driver. But when life gets a little easier, it makes you too confident. And you start calling everyone ace. And you're better than that. Well, GEICO has a 97% customer satisfaction rating and has been saving people money for 85 years. It's hard to beat that. But you're right. Switch to GEICO. It's obviously a good idea. In the fight against COVID-19, testing offers another layer of protection in addition to vaccines. Go to vdh.virginia.gov and search by zip code to find a free COVID-19 test near you. A message from your Virginia Department of Health. I ain't no rock and rolling. I ain't been to town. I got 20 to 30 years before they lay me down. And I don't want no tears. No reason to get down when I die. Don't shut my party down. Don't shut my funny story could, could be a considered a funny song though there's two parts that to that song um i have a notorious habit of of uh staying up way too way way later than i should and so um a lot of times uh my girlfriend kelly makes fun of me and she'll she'll laugh at me and and, and just say well you know it's like you know, she, she'll say, I think she said one night, she said, uh, you just, you're never going to let anything or anybody shut your party down or something to that degree, you know, mm-hmm. kind of referencing the fact that I wouldn't just get up and go to bed. I'll just sit there and fall asleep in my chair. And that, that night I happened to just take her advice and get up and go to bed. And as soon as I got halfway to the bedroom, I started thinking about what she said about, you're not going to let anybody shut your party down. And of course, this is before the shutdown and all right. this stuff. It has nothing to do with that. But um, when when she said that, it just sounded like a song, you know. And I got my iPhone, and by the time I wrote the song, I mean, I wrote the song in probably, oh, 
five minutes, you know, completed. I don't even think I changed anything, which is really weird because usually when you write these things, you know, you go back five or six times and have to, you know, figure out, you know, reword it or, you know, take this out or that out. But I don't mm-hmm. think I took anything out. And so that's kind of what, what, what drove the song, but, you know, songwriting is such a funny thing. You, 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 you sometimes predict things that haven't even happened yet. You sometimes say things that, that, that are inside of your subconscious that you don't really even realize you're saying or getting at. Yeah. And as, and as far as that song, I think that song really is, I've always, you know, the one thing I've, I've always been truly scared of other than, you know, you know, the, the biggest fear I think I would ever have would be to lose my son. You know, I think that's the worst thing that could ever happen to a parent. But beyond that is just losing my own life. I, you know, I have a really strong will to live and, and really enjoy life and, and my life. And I think that song is, is subconsciously, uh, my fear of death, oh, yeah. which I think subconsciously goes into the reason why I stay up and fall asleep in a chair uh-huh. is, is to me, sleep is great and everything, but to some degree I've always equated sleep with, you know, you know, I'll kind of sleep when I die kind of thing. Uh-huh. And I'm, I'm, I'm notorious for, for, uh, just staying up way past when I should. So that's the story on that one. Can you talk a little bit about recording the album? Yeah, that was a huge, 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 tremendous opportunity, and a, and a just a, I mean, it was like being a, in, a, you know, just hard to believe that you were there, and and not so. Much, and and people ask me a lot of times because of where I recorded it and stuff, you know, and, and the things that that were recorded there, you know, a lot of people were the the immediate go to would be, well, you know, could you feel. You know those those spirits in there of the, all the people Johnny Cash and Loretta Lynn and you know Elvis Cut Bob Dylan all these people you know and, mm-hmm. and it was like really you know the the really uh, you know uh, non romantic answer is no <laughs> <laughs> because we, I mean really we were so focused we had such a small amount of time to get in there and do what we were going to do. But the other thing was was just the room was so fantastic. I mean it's it it. It looked like all those rooms that I've I've looked at in books, you know, for years of recording studios where they were just big open rooms, you know, Columbia Records and and um and and beyond that, the the amount of equipment we had, I mean the basement was just filled with case after case of all these microphones, vintage microphones, new microphones, I mean millions and millions of dollars worth of equipment. Yeah. And um we had a reverb chamber in the basement which was you know, as a, as as far as singing, having that kind of sound quality while you're singing uh-huh. in the cans is is highly inspiring. Uh, we had a we had a tape machine in there which we ran on the vocals sometimes, but and then you know the way these old studios were set up, like at Columbia, and and they would have you know it would be a big open room, but you could they had partitions in there. And so, you know, you could you could take this this big open room, which basically translated to like a big blank canvas and basically turn it into any kind of figuration of studio you want, you know, just by using these partitions. I yeah. mean, we we use partitions just to build a vocal booth at one time mm-hmm. you know, and stuff. So just just being able to be around all that kind of stuff and, and I, don't, I don't know how to describe it. There's just something I'm I'm a recording fanatic. I mean, that's. I love playing in front of people. Don't get me wrong. That's, that's, I I love the thrill of a a great night and everybody's kind of has, you know, on that same, same wavelength of, you know, you're, you're in that groove kind of thing with the crowd and the band and, and, and I, Hey, I I live for that, but really honestly, where I I like to spend most of my time and it's, it's honestly, the shutdown has kind of benefited me in that way because it, it finally forced me off the, off the road a little bit just constant gigging and doing shows. I, I mean, I'd rather just spend my time making, making songs or yeah. uh, making films, you know, that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. I'm, I'm way more into the creative vibe of it, you know, get, getting up at, you know, 7am and being in the, in the, the place by nine o'clock and, mm-hmm. 
usually home by five. Right. <laughs> yeah. A nine to five uh, rock and roll musician. That's it, man. Yeah. I'm four. I'm 43 years old, man, yeah, yeah. And, and I'll be 44 in June. And and I'm not trying to say I'm an old man or anything, but you just, you know, man, I, I've 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 done that. I've driven up and down the damn road. I mean, I've gone all over the country and various different things. And it's just, it, honestly, it's nice not to have to get in a van and drive somewhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it's nice to have done it. And then it's nice to not have to do it anymore. Also the non rom romantic answer there yeah, to that yeah. question. <laughs> <laughs> but no, honestly, Ron, I tell you the thing I found um, that's worked for me the most you know, all that touring and stuff, I understand you have to get your name out there. And, and really back in 2007, that helped, helped you know, that album I put out hard luck and, and going around with Bob and stuff, it turned me on to so many different audiences that I would have never been, you know, probably turned on to at that time. But, you know, um, I think the best thing I, I ever did was, uh, after my, my good, my best friend and bandmate in the low counts, Austin Hicks passed, you know, I made a real steady, um, um, effort to just really stay close to home, um, play, you know, not any further than like, you know, uh, Georgia, Tennessee, Virginia, kind of around that kind of area, South Carolina, mm -hmm. and just focus all my efforts into what I like to do, which is, is being in the studio and making, films and well which started out making music videos and then basically went back into uh to making full-length films and getting to where i am now with film which is what i wanted to be when i was about 14 years old oh, yeah. i put i put the guitar down for a little bit i started on it when i was 12 but when i was 14 you know i i went to i would be studying directors oh, oliver really? stone and oh, well. you know i'd say oh i like the way his lighting is and i yeah. still do like the way all his lighting is in his movies and stuff now, i've but seen I to go to i've like, seen your uh music videos but you're you're i mean yeah. you're talking about making like film shorts and that sort of thing right that kind of stuff yeah exactly and that's that's basically what i was doing when i was 14 and 15 making up characters 16 going in you know places in public as these characters with my you know, teenage film crew uh -huh. and, and everything. But I wanted to go to film school and uh, that never, that really never took shape. I got back into the guitar a little bit. And, and then when I graduated high school, they made you think back then that if you didn't go to college, your absolute life was just going to be an absolute failure. Yeah. So like a fool, I went to art school for six months. Uh -huh. but I can draw a little bit, but yeah. I found out real quick that I'm not an artist <laughs> once I got to art school. <laughs> <laughs> so I dropped out there, but no, once I started making videos though, um, music videos, it really took me, took me into film quite a bit. And then, um, the guy that's MC for the show and, and the technical producer for the Friday night gamble, uh, who's helped me also film two of my last videos. Don't, don't shut my party down and come here no more. Uh, his name's Tony Presswood and, and through, through, um, my friendship with him, he's big into film too. So, so I've, through my association with him, I've met all these actors and, mm -hmm. and all these folks that are into this. So it's, it's allowed me to jump back into that pond yeah, yeah. too. And, um, but anyway, with all this stuff, you know, film, music videos, um, making albums, you know, my, my kind of thing was, I'm just sick of riding up and down the road. Um, not that I wasn't making good money for it either, because I, I'm not one of these cats that will, you know, drive up and down the road for, you know, just to break even with that. I mean, my, my thing with playing music ever since I started was I, I have to treat this like a real business. I have to make a good income right. or there's, I can't do it, you know? And that's the only thing that sustained me, uh, for better part of 20 years as playing music, you know, full time with no other, other job or income or anything like that. So, um, but but my 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 goal was is just to sit down and and put down a lot of output, and hopefully just let people come to me, you yeah. know. And and I think that formula for better, for, you know, for for whatever you know foresight I had or didn't have, it's really it really worked out for me last year. And and really, I think I had probably the most successful year I've ever had last oh, year, cool. which is crazy. Yeah. And and. Like you said, I, you know, as far as doing shows, I mean, I maybe did five, you know, the whole year. I've heard that and from a, from quite a bizarre. few musicians that have said that, you know, they've, there's been a positive about, you know, a shutdown. And I think basically just, uh, 
you know, playing music is the kind of thing where if you're going to do it full time, if you're going to do it for a living, it's hard to make yourself stop and take a breath or take a rest because exactly. it's so, exactly. you know, because it's not, it's not guaranteed. So right. you can't take, you can't say no to somebody, especially if it's decent money, because it might not, you might not get a, a you know, an offer two weeks from now. And, every, and everything's an opportunity. Yeah. And if you're smart, you, you know, and that's something I learned early on. And I was talking to someone about that. You know, if you're smart, you say yes to everything, even if you're not ready. Yeah. And, um, and a lot of times, I mean, that's, that, that goes back to this album, Burnout Soul. When my good friend, Michael Fawn called me from Columbia, you know, from, excuse me, from Nashville and said, Hey man, you know, I've got an opportunity for you. Do you want to rec- record an album? And I said, yeah. He said, well, you know, do you have songs for it? You know, you have some songs. Oh yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. And, and basically, you know, it, it was like, you know, I didn't hear from him for a couple months, you know? Mm-hmm. So I kind of started losing, like maybe it just didn't, it wasn't going to happen. And all of a sudden he was like, Hey man, can you all of a sudden got in touch with me and was like, Hey, you know, the, the studio is going to be free this time. And you know, can, can you, um, can you be here in like two weeks yeah. with your songs, you know? And, and I didn't have a thing written. Oh, I, mean, I really yeah. didn't. I had just released an album the month before. Um, so I was, you know, busy promoting it and working right. on that every day and, and dealing with radio folks and my radio guy. And, and so, I mean, you know, the focus, there's only so much one person can do. And the focus got off those songs really quick. And, and I'm not the guy that's like going to just go sit down and write songs. You mm-hmm. know I mean? Basically when it's time to write an album, you know, I just kind of will go back. Like I think a lot of musicians do, you, you record fragments of ideas on your iPhone and yeah. stuff like that. And you just wait, I just wait for things to hit me. I've never had to write under the gun. But he said, um, you know, I think you might hear Showbud here in the background. But anyway, he said, you know, can you have these songs ready in two weeks? And I knew that I had no songs. I mean, Mm -hmm. I was completely empty. I had nothing in the reserves, anything. But I said yes, because I wasn't going to pass up the opportunity. And just I I just know from so many times when I said yes to things that I wasn't ready. To me, that really separates um, if you'll be successful or if you, you won't, because that there's 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 two parts to that saying yes to something you're not ready for well it's a big big move and everything like that and to be commended but then and and you've got the opportunity and it's there and it's yours and and it's it's in its secure little place but then comes the other part you have to step up and perform right, right. so that that's i think that's the real um guillotine to mm-hmm. that circumstance you know is yeah. that can you can you can you do it and a lot of people can't and that's a really hell there's been times that I've, I've done it and i couldn't do it you know and mm-hmm. that's a really disheartening thing but you have to get past that too you right know? so you, i think just music going out here and do this you're taking a lot of chances but you have to really say yes to a lot of things that you can't do at the time hell when i first started playing music i had no business even being on the stage everything i learned i learned on the stage basically you know and and that's kind of I've I've kind of carried that theory throughout my whole everything. I don't, I'm not a big re- person to rehearse. I don't you know rehearse songs before I go in the studio really a lot. You know I'm, I'm just in fact uh, as far as making films, I will say how that bleeds into making films is that I've learned that a lot of times like uh, Tony, my good friend Tony Presswood, that I make a lot of these films with, he's a big stickler on scripts. Uh-huh. which is a hard thing for me because I've always just, you know, improvised and ad libbed, you know, right. but it's funny. You, you know, you, even with that kind of stuff, you, you find different people have different approaches and you, you, you learn to take a little bit of that and, and, and harness it in just a little bit. And right. That's, right. That's, that's, where a, things I mean, good. that's a collaboration. That's a, exactly. You don't want to so. collaborate with somebody who's just like you. And I, and I've so. learned from Tony too, as far as like that side, cause I've never had to, you know, do do uh, a script and, mm-hmm. and i mean I, working on film like we did a film uh i basically just bullied my way into his <laughs> his film production team uh-huh. it's called astro jane and they were doing this thing called the final the, the 48 hour film competition in greensboro and it's where you have this uh you have 48 hours to make a film they give you a, a subject and then you have a prop you have to use and a line you have to use and they compete, but you have to make like a, 
I think it's like a seven minute film. Mm -hmm. So when he started working on the come here, no more video, I, I just basically just bullied my way in. But, uh, it was funny because I had, I learned so much and I, and I, on that, on that, uh, on that, that little film, I, I was assistant and I, I didn't go into it being assistant director, but I somehow got that. And, uh, I played a role in it, but also I got to run the click track, you know, the click, the clacker, you yeah. know, and learn how that works and that whole, and I mean, I'd never even done that kind of stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was just interesting to, to, to go to different parts of the, you know, a new realm of something you've always been yeah. into and, and to learn. You do learn, you, you definitely do learn from people if, if they're doing it right. You know.
You know, I I think that one could be a uh, like I, every time I listen back to that, it just it feels like uh, it could be like the intro to like a Stacy Keach crime drama or uh-huh. something. You know, um, that song is actually just uh, me and Chuck Cotton. Just um, there was you know a lot of some of the other songs have have other musicians on, on it and everything, but uh, yeah, that one just. <laughs> I don't know. That one's it kind of found me. Um, when I was young, I, I used to write poetry and all these short prose and stuff like that, 15, 16. And uh, about uh, three or four years ago, my mom called me and said, hey, I've got this huge trash bag full of all these books of yours, you know, notebooks. And I'm going to throw them out if you don't come get them. So I came and got them. And uh, I started going through some of them. And um, back the last album I did before this one, The Midnight Strain, I had a song called Guru Blue on it. And I thought, man, it'd be really fun to see if I can write a song with lines from these old poetry books, you know, mm-hmm. that I had when I was. And sure enough, that's what I did. I pieced together a song. So for my next move, uh, you know, with having to write so many songs, eight songs in two weeks, I went back to that method oh, yeah. again. And um, basically, that's what that song is. It's just a lot of um, stream of consciousness kind of stuff. I think it to me, it's like uh, if I had to put a name on, I'd say it's like my Jack Kerouac song. Oh, yeah. You know? yeah. It's it's, um, you know, it talks about people that just kind of can't stay in one place. And uh, I think probably looking back in those old books, I was probably, you know, reading on the road and, mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff back then. So I'm, I'm not surprised that that's what came out, you know, to some degree. But um, the funny thing about that song is uh, I got the idea for this harmonica kind of hook to it. And... Uh, and we were in the studio and, and in desperation, I, I was like, man, I, I got to find a D harp. You know, I don't carry harmonicas around, nor do I profess to be a, a harmonica player. But I actually bought a like a $15 harmonica uh-huh. and it had like two of the reeds blown out in it. Mm-hmm. But somehow we were able to make that damn thing work. And uh, yeah, that's that's a that's a I, I'm, I like that song. I like playing it. It's a yeah. lot of fun. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. You know, um, I was talking to a harmonica player one time, and um, he mentioned that his uh, his favorite harp. What did he say? I think he said it was like a it was like a five hole harp. It's very limited, but uh, he just said he said you know it makes it just makes you it makes you figure things out. You know, having having a small harp. He said I just I always like the sound of it. It's a cheap. It's probably probably fifteen dollar harp or something like that. He got somewhere. And uh, and just always like the sound of it, you know. You have you have those cheap instruments you, that one day at the factory somebody just for some reason puts a little extra into it, and you know it just gets put out in the world, yeah. uh, one out of a million, uh, made by you know not a uh, made by like a cheap off brand company, uh, but it just mm-hmm. sounds really good. And somebody and, the, and and it gets in the right hands of somebody who can do something with it, you know. If you yeah, if you can do so, you know, I tell you, young guitar pickers out there listening, or, or um, you know, you you know, at times, I've done things like play only three strings on my guitar, you know, yeah. and take the other ones off. Yeah, because yeah. we, I mean, really, when you take away, and that's one thing about the low counts that was that happened, just 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 happened because with Austin, the way he played drums, man, I mean. He played like Keith Moon or Ginger Baker or one of those guys, you know, and 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 that's with the way I play uh, finger style guitar, you know, and playing with bass lines and stuff, finger picking. I mean, we just didn't need anybody else. It was ridiculous. I was like, why would we pay anybody else when we could make double the money, you know, more than money? Yeah. And um, but he was such a wild man the way he played and 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 and, and like, you know he played like. Uh, Ginger Baker and and that's you know that's a lot of who we were influenced by was Cream to a huge degree we got into that stuff you know mm-hmm. and old Fleetwood Mac and stuff but you know find, that's another thing that I found that helped me with songwriting and especially kind of tame my guitar playing down to some because you know I'm I'm a big I'm a big fan of what BB King says and I'm sure you've heard it and I'm sure everybody's gonna 
say they've heard it too. It's going around a lot. Are you getting paid by the note or are you getting, you know, paid by the gig kind of mm-hmm. thing? So, um, but it really toned my guitar playing down. Not that I was ever like a doodly 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 kind of guy, you know, but it did, it did make me have to look at the guitar in a completely different way Mm -hmm. when and and taking you know uh when you take things away you don't have a bass player or a keyboard player all these people to lean on and it's all you you have to i mean you really have to rewire the way your brain thinks especially coming from the world that i was coming from where i always had a support of a bass player or whatever i could i could just you know do what i wanted to do so you know it's interesting though when you when you um when you take things away, it's a, it's a it, it makes you it makes you better. Yeah, like it does. Right. And I've always liked playing, you know, with the odds against me. You know, that it, it'll make you play better. It makes me play better to some degree. Okay, I want to thank Matt for being on the show. Don't forget, you can find his music at mattwalshmusic.net, and you can find his new album, Burnt Out Soul, wherever you get your music. Go right now and look at some old episodes of the Friday Night Gamble. You can find that by searching YouTube or go to Matt's uh, music Facebook page and um, you will just really enjoy it. Make sure to go in this like Friday night, uh, what do you call it, appointment viewing. Uh, So it's a a really cool show. I think you'll like it. And also keep an eye out for Matt's new album he's going to be recording soon. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, WNC original music available on all the platforms. I dare you to find a platform that the podcast is not available on. And also, uh, if you have questions, feel free to email WNC original music at gmail.com. Also, if you'd like to send in a closing song, if you're not from the Western North Carolina area, just uh, send that along to WNC original music at gmail.com. Go back and listen to this last uh, narration and see if you can tell where I had to stop and have a sneezing fit. There's definitely a change in my voice uh, following that sneezing fit. Just a little, little insider info for you. Don't forget to follow the podcast on Facebook and Instagram and also join our group, Western NC Original Music, where you can uh, see and hear music from not just the podcast, but for a whole bunch of Western North Carolina musicians, the best musicians uh, in the world. That's it for now. Have a good week. There are some things in this world when it comes to tacos that are just sacred. (laughs) Cox can help make your home smarter and your life easier. Now you can use your Contour voice remote to connect to your home life cameras so you can view them right on your TV screen using simple voice commands. That makes it easy to keep tabs on what's happening around your home right from your couch. Need to keep an eye on the kids when they're playing outside? Just say, show me my backyard camera into your Cox voice remote and watch them while you're in the house. And if you're waiting for a delivery and want to make sure it's there on time, no problem. Just say, show me driveway camera to check on it with your Home Life HD cameras on the TV screen while you go about your day. When you live in a home powered by Cox Internet, you can stay connected to what matters and let Cox take care of the rest. To learn more about all the benefits of your connected home, visit cox.com slash this is home today. Switching to Geico is a good idea, especially when you consider everything. First off, Geico makes it easy to switch. They have licensed agents available 24-7 online or over the phone. But if it's so easy, you might start thinking everything is easy, even big wave surfing. And it's not. It's actually quite difficult. Well, if you switch to Geico, you could save hundreds on car insurance. And you could keep saving by bundling your motorcycle, boat, and RV, plus your home or renter's insurance. But saving money might lead you to make some questionable purchases, like a 20-foot feather boa. And do you know how hard it is to clean a 20-foot feather boa? Well, they do have an industry-leading mobile app you can use to pay your bill, file and manage a claim, or add a new driver. But when life gets a little easier, it makes you too confident. And you start calling everyone ace. And you're better than that. 
Well, GEICO has a 97% customer satisfaction rating and has been saving people money for 85 years. It's hard to beat that. But you're right. Switch to GEICO. It's obviously a good idea.